good afternoon or evening or I guess whatever your time zone may be. I'm Aaron Channel. This is California Convictions, the YouTube channel where I talk about my experiences in prison, jail, my life, I guess. I did a grip of time in CDC, that's the California Department of Corrections, 16 and a half years. So I've got a lot to talk about, if we're being frank. I started my term in county jail, of course, like everybody does, and I was there for about nine months until I was convicted and sentenced to some time. They send you to a reception center first. The purpose of a reception center is to classify you as an inmate. They want to determine whether you're an escape risk, whether you're super violent. Maybe if you have some disability that makes it so you're more likely to be victimized by other people. For instance, if you are blind, you're not going to be sent to the same prison as just anybody because it would be too easy for somebody to take advantage of you. I was classified at San Quentin State Prison down there in the Bay Area. San Quentin was an experience. You would ro you roll up on it and it looks like an old castle. The walls are so tall, topped with concertina wire. There are guard towers sparsely, uh, <clears throat> sparsely placed all around the perimeter. And you look up and you can see in some of them guards with guns. They open up a big, long gate. And they roll you in and kick you out. You go through all the various processes to be classified. They start by getting you to the safest area for your group. I was a high security inmate. I started in a clump of about 20 people. And after about 10 minutes of standing in this line, waiting to be processed, a sergeant came walking up, maybe a lieutenant, a ranking officer, and he hollered, where's the level four killer? All 20 of us got, got a little uncomfortable. Who's the, the level four killer? And looked up. And the sergeant looked at his little paper and went, channel, kidnapping, carjacking, manslaughter. Come on, level four killer, where are you? It was kind of an awkward moment. <laughs> And he uh, pulled me out of the line of the other 20 inmates because I was the only person in the group that was going to be placed in the high security classification area. You go through a lot of single step processes in order to be initially placed in your cell. You have to, you arrive at the prison, they're going to have to check and see if you have any exigent medical problems. You know, are you bleeding? Are you hallucinating? Are you crazy? There's a lot of questions they got to ask, and they have a little list just to make sure you're not going to die in the next two or three days before they get you to a doctor. After they've done that, they give you your clothes that you're going to have to wear to, cla to make clear that you're a classification inmate, that you shouldn't be able to mingle with all of the other inmates. They're going to cut your hair if it's too long. I understand they don't do that necessarily anymore, but whenever I started my term, they explained it very simply. We're going to cut your hair all the way down, and if you don't like it, we're going to pin you down and do it. It turned out this wasn't true. They weren't pinning people down and cutting their hair at this point in CDC, but it was the story that they sold in order to you know, bully people into, yeah, everybody has to get their hair short in case they have lice or fleas or anything like that. And then they're going to move you to the part of the prison where you're going to do your little chunk of time until they have the time to actually sit down and interview you and evaluate your file and decide whether you're a big risk or not. Whether you're the guy who's going to jump over the wall or stab a guard or do whatever it is they're afraid of people doing. I was placed in Badger Section at San Quentin. Badger section was five tiers, meaning a row of 50 cells, and then a set of stairs up to the next tier. And then again, a set of stairs up to the next tier after 50 cells, five tiers all stacked on top of each other. On the other side of the building, meaning that you have all of the cells against one wall, on the other side, there are catwalks that the cops can walk across up and down so that they can see into the cells on the other side of the uh, chasm. And there's razor wire all throughout the area making sure that nobody can get acrobatic and start trying to climb from one tier to another, jump across the chasm. <clears throat> I wasn't there for very long. Routinely, you expect to be 
classifying, you know, going through the process of them evaluating whether you're a high risk inmate for uh, about a month, two months, three months, depending on the circumstance. I got fortunate. I think I was there at the, for the minimum amount of time, which was about 35 days. San Quentin was a rough place to spend even 35 days. I, I speak often about how filthy it was, and it does stand out, because the tears stunk. The whole prison had a, a bad smell to it. I later discovered that the reason for this bad smell was because the area in which they keep the plumbing behind the cells, the plumbing of the electric, so that inmates aren't allowed to access it, called the chase, had a problem with leaking waste and hadn't been cleared over just decades, perhaps even centuries of filth buildup. Well, century of filth buildup. There was a big lawsuit about it, and so I got to read the specifics as to why San Quentin stunk. I can just tell you it did. There were rats, probably cockroaches, though I don't remember seeing any. A reception yard, which is what I was on there at San Quentin, you don't interact with other inmates or even with staff very much. You go out to the yard once or twice a week at most. You see staff whenever you go to meals. But by and large, you're in your cell the entire time. They're trying to restrict your movement. They're trying to restrict your access to anything you could use to cause trouble because they have not yet determined whether you're going to go to a nice, easy, minimum security yard, a fire camp, or whether they're going to send you to a serious yard. They delineate yards by number. Level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4. It's just, it gets more secure and more dangerous the higher you go up to level 4. Typically, a level 4 yard is the most secure yard that you will be sent to off the gate, meaning that you've went through the reception center and they've decided to send you to a level 4 yard. If you get to that level 4 yard and you do something seriously bad, for instance, you stab somebody, kill somebody, get caught with some drugs... Enough that they decide to send you to the SHU. SHU, S-H-U, means Segregated Housing Unit. And it's the prison inside of the prison. If you're just such a problem that you can't be allowed to interact with other inmates, with other guards, well, they send you to the SHU. And that's where all the real problem children are. Once you get out of the SHU, you're going to get kicked back out to a level 4 yard, but they have special level 4 yards just for guys who are coming out of the shoe, meaning they started you on a level 4 yard, and you couldn't even program there at the most secure standard yard that they have. So they have a new type of yard for you. It's called a level 4 180 design. Level 4 180 just means that the buildings are designed in such a way that the cop up in the tower with a gun has a 180 degree field of vision, meaning he only has to look out of his tower at what's directly in front of him. He never has to turn his head. There's no place for inmates to go that isn't directly in front of the guard with a gun because there are walls restricting their movement. He has a 180 degree field of view which covers the entire building the inmates live in. I never made it to a 180 yard, thankfully, because those are the most secure standard yards in CDC. I was sent to a level four yard, but because I didn't stab anybody, because I didn't get caught with drugs or anything like that, I managed to work my points down, level three, level two, instead of going up to that 180 yard. I was originally sent to High Desert State Prison after San Quentin. High Desert is in Northern California, deep Northern California. And it was an interesting place to do time for a number of reasons. First, because it was such a rural place. There was very little visiting. A lot of the people there at the prison were from the Bay Area or even Southern California. And it is a long drive. California is a long state. You can drive for 10 hours to get from one end of the state to the other. As a result, because very few of the people living there in High Desert in Susanville, California, had grown up anywhere near there, knew anybody near there, there was very little visiting. I was fortunate. My wife visited me regularly whenever she was able to, and I was one of the very few people who was out there in the visiting room on a weekly basis. High Desert was also interesting in that the demographics of High Desert, it's primarily a white prison. CDC 
intentionally has prisons which have uh, racial quotas. They have X number of Hispanics, X number of African Americans, X number of Caucasians by percentage out of the thousand or so inmates they have on a yard. As a clerk, whenever I did work as a clerk, it was occasionally my job to count out how many inmates of each group were in a yard and report it to the lieutenant so that he could make sure that they were meeting their little standards. They try and have X number of, P X number of each group at a specific prison. High Desert was predominantly Caucasian, which uh, because I am Caucasian and because CDC, prison in general, is such a racially charged environment, uh, there were benefits to this. It's sad to say, and I didn't like it at the time, and I'm speaking about it now as something that isn't fair or right, the white guys up at High Desert got a lot of extra privileges. The good jobs went to white guys, the lockdowns weren't as severe for white guys, and most of the cops were white. It's not always like that. Whenever I went to other prisons, which were predominantly housed by this group or that group, those groups were the ones that got the advantages. But High Desert, where I did my first seven years on a standard yard, it was an uncomfortable place to do time, and I think it would have been just a lot worse if I weren't the correct skin color to be able to program there. Disgusting, but true. Australian Prison Stories says, What's up, bro? I'm a new subscriber from Sydney, Australia, and spent 17 years of my life in and out of prison. I've been out and clean from heroin for nine years. Congratulations, man. That, that is a real and true accomplishment. People say nine years. I hear 3,300 days. Not picking that up. And for anybody who hasn't struggled, struggled with addiction, you may not be able to correlate exactly how long that is. But that is a true accomplishment. Congratulations, Australian Prison Stories. I haven't checked out your channel, but I will in the future. Right on. And he further says, uh, Aussie Prison Talk AU. Very interesting. Uh, Schleese Girl asks, if there was a particular prison I was always afraid of being transferred to. And that's an interesting question. Uh, in reality, I think High Desert was a prison that I was afraid of being transferred to. That place was a rock and roll and people die there. And I was there for six and a half, maybe seven years of not getting into trouble. And to be clear, in a correctional environment, 80% of not getting into trouble is following the rules. It's whenever the guy says, hey, do you want some drugs? You go, no, man, I'm all right. Or whenever the guy gives you a funny look, you don't plex up and go, well, come on, let's do it. You know, it's minding your P's and Q's, trying to not get in trouble. That's 80%. The other 20% is just dumb luck. Prison is not a place where you can resolve, you're going to follow all the rules, you're never going to get into trouble, and expect that you're going to be able to, without any problems, do that. You can just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The yard goes down and all of a sudden there's guys rushing you and you better stand up and fight because if you lie down, well, they're just going to kick you on the ground. And then at the end of the day, they do this report and they give it to you and it says that you started it. You're the guy that's in trouble. And that's what the report says. And there is nothing you can do to dispute what is written down on that piece of paper. Your perceptions of events do not matter. A peace officer says he saw you start a fight, says he saw you participating in a fight, says he saw whatever he saw. But they write these reports by filling in blanks. They just real quick as they can, decide who was in trouble, who did wrong, and prosecute them, charge them if they have to, and get it done with. This isn't due process like we think of it in the real world out in society where there is a jury that determines your guilt and it must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. In prison, in order to be found guilty of a wrongdoing and have more time added to your sentence, more points added to your classification score so that you stay on a level 4 facility, a level 3 facility, you work your way up that and maybe eventually end up in the shoe, that 180 yard I was talking about. They have an officer who's referred to as a hearing officer. And his job is to look at the facts of the report, and it's just going to be a couple of paragraphs written by another cop, and say whether he thinks you probably did it. More likely than not. That is a very low standard of proof. It's called a preponderance of evidence. And it's used in CDC because it makes it easy to determine that people are guilty or innocent in just a couple of minutes. 
I managed a program for well, six and a half years or so at High Desert State Prison, and my points dropped to level three, meaning I was allowed to leave the institution. Around the same time that my points dropped, things got pretty crazy on the yard I was on, and a couple of guys got stabbed. There was some real unpleasantness, things were racially charged, and it was fixing to get really bad. I, I tapped. What that means in normal nomenclature is that I went to the police, the cops on the yard, and I told them I can't be here anymore. This isn't a safe place for me. You have to send me to a yard where you keep guys that can't program with the, the gang members, the general population inmates. It's called Entering Protective Custody or Becoming SNY. SNY stands for Sensitive Needs Yard. I've done a video in the past on exactly why I went to a sensitive needs yard. I don't want to go into any great depth on it now. But I feel it's important to say that I, I'm not ashamed of why I went to prison. I'm not ashamed of why I went SNY. I, I tried to make the right choices to do the good thing. If the circumstances had been different, if I had been able to, I would have programmed with the fellows for the whole time, and I happily would have done that, in spite of the fact that I didn't like the gangs and I really didn't like the racism that is rampant in CDC. But I didn't like the alternative either, because once you enter SNY and they send you to a protective custody yard, an SNY yard, you have a lot less choice as to who you're going to program with. For starters, rats. All the guys that inform on other inmates, pull sneaky little moves to avoid doing prison time informed on their gangs. Well, of course, they're all going to be on those SNY yards. And that's just to start with. They're also going to have all of these sex offenders on those yards. They need to keep them somewhere, and the SNY yards are the safe place for guys that can't get along with other inmates. You've also going to have some guys who are just weird. Maybe they have slight psychological or neurological problems. Perhaps they're disabled in ways that make them difficult to get along with. Uh, perhaps they have a colostomy bag, which if you live with a dude who has a colostomy bag, it stinks occasionally. It's a bummer. Whatever the issue is that got you sent to an SNY yard, everybody there is very concerned with programming effectively, with not getting into any trouble. I recall an occasion where I had a friend who uh, he thought he was tough and he pushed up on another inmate and the inmate had no problem. He said, you touch me again, I'm going to go tell right now and they're going to get you off this yard. And my friend thought about it for a second and realized the other inmate was right. If he pushed up on this inmate, if he tried to say, hey, I don't like you for whatever reason and his reason for disliking this inmate was valid, well... They were going to move him off the yard, and they weren't going to have anywhere else to put him because he already said, I can't go hang out with the gang members. They're too scary. And I don't want to hang out with the, the sex offenders. They're disgusting. Gosh, fellas, is there anywhere else I can go in CDC? And the cops will explain to you very politely that, yes, there is. It's called a cell back in the hole all by yourself. If you can't get along with anybody, that's just fine. You don't have to. You keep having problems. They will lock you all by yourself in a room, and you can do as long as you want all by yourself in that room. Guys end up doing years, decades, on single cell status, walk alone, just because they can't program for whatever reason, either because they're predators or prone to predation. Uh, one moment. Australian Prison Stories notes that he only did his time in maximum prisons, and I'm not actually familiar with how they, uh, how they delineate levels of security in Australian prisons, but I read an interesting book that started in an Australian prison. I believe it was called uh, Shantaram, Ashtaram, I can't remember, but they spoke briefly about the environment in Australian prisons, and they sounded pretty rockin' and rollin', honestly. So, I'm glad you made it out, and good luck to you. Nathaniel Hayes says that uh, he found my channel right after I took a break, and he's been binging all my videos over the past few months. Uh, well, I'm glad to have you around. I'm going to be doing live streams pretty stinking regularly, as demonstrated by the past week. And I will keep putting out regular content. It's eh, just falling behind a little bit. Let's see here. I'll read a couple of comments. Uh, 
I was asked how I felt about Chowchilla. That is a very interesting question. You see, Chowchilla is a level two facility, and it is in Central California. It is the last prison at which I did my time, and it had started its life as a women's prison. In the early 2000s, all the way up to today, really, there's been a problem with prison overcrowding in California. Around 2014 or so, they decided that one of the things they were going to do to make it so that they had more places to put inmates was to grant early release to a large number of female inmates. They released hundreds, perhaps thousands, of female inmates over the course of a year or two so that they could take uh, one of the female prisons, Chowchilla, and turn it into a male prison. Purportedly, there is not a great degree of difference in quality of life amongst men and women in CDC, and it's not something I can speak at any great length to, because I only did my time in the male part of the prisons, obviously. However, Chowchilla had been designed and built to be a women's prison, and so there were a number of differences that just really spoke to the concern for quality of life of the inmates. Uh, one would be the size of the dormitories. In high desert, you lived in a cell, and it was a small cell. It wasn't much bigger than what would you think of than what you would think of as a bathroom. If you go to a Motel Six, you could fit three, maybe four cells in the room that they rent you there at the Hotel Six. But you're only sharing it with one other person, so it's not too bad. However, as your custody level drops, they start cramming more people into commensurate levels of space. Once I went to the substance abuse treatment facility, that's SADF in Corcoran, California, I was allowed to live in a dormitory. I got to live in a number of dormitories, and it was my experience that they would generally try and take two, three, maybe four cells worth of area and try and cram 10 or 15 times as many people into that same small space. You would have 14 guys sharing one toilet. You would have 14 guys or 20 guys all crammed together into a little area. Because it's lower security, they're going to put up with more from the administration. They know you'll put up with more because you didn't get in trouble whenever you were higher security. This was not the case in Chowchilla. The dormitories in Chowchilla were huge. It, I had two, maybe three times as much personal space, by which I mean that I could stand up next to my bed and write something or sit on my rack, and I wasn't in anybody's way. I could even feel like working out and sit down next to my bed and do sit-ups and push-ups, and I was far enough away from the next bunk that I wasn't encroaching upon anybody's space. You had a great ratio of inmates to communal facilities. Uh, in most places, it felt like you had a, oh, at least 10 to 1, perhaps sometimes 15 to 1 inmate to uh, restroom, to toilet ratio. In Chowchilla, it was uh, 8 to 1. And that was higher than it had been under the women. Under the women, it had been 4 to 6 women to one restroom. Similarly for phones, it, they just put a lot more effort into making sure there were enough communal facilities for everybody. Additionally, in Chowchilla, they had some resources that were not at other places. There was a actual theater where they had played movies every week. You could go with about 50 other inmates, 80 other inmates, and you'd all sit down in chairs, and they had a big poster up on the wall, a big white thing which you project films onto. I didn't see that at any other institution. Similarly, they had better exercise equipment. Whenever we arrived there, I wasn't there for this, but I got to speak to some of the guys that were in the first bus of male inmates arriving at Chowchilla. They said the food was the best food they'd eaten while they were incarcerated, that the portions were huge, it was well cooked, that it was essentially the same food, but that there was more to eat, that it was better prepared, and that all of the, the meat and goodies hadn't been picked out of the meal. However, once they finished moving the last women out of the facility, and there was no point where men and women were interacting, 
But there was a point at which both men and women were housed at the institution. They would have one yard for men and one yard for women. Once the last bus of women left, the food dropped back down to the, the standards which the inmates were used to. So apparently a food had been a lot better prior to them flipping the yard. <clears throat> Max says, thanks for putting out consistently high quality content. Do I have any stories or anecdotes about suicide in prison? I do actually have a story about suicide in prison that I haven't told, and I'll tell it briefly. I had a friend at High Desert State Prison about four years into my incarceration. Uh, he, myself, and three other guys had a weekly routine where every Saturday night, whenever we all had our same thing we could do, We'd go out to the day room and play Dungeons and Dragons. We were nerds. And yes, there are nerds in CDC. And we were the guys that would be over in the corner with all the books laid out playing a silly game. It's no different than other silly games that inmates play, but we'd done it for a while. His name was D. Well, I didn't know anything about what happened to D except that one night... I heard a cop start yelling at his cell because his cell was just a little bit below mine. Uh, yeah, get down right now. Get away. Open. The I went to the door and I saw them take Dee's Selly out. Dee's Selly was an older dude, about 65 years old. Yeah, well, about 60 years old. I'm exaggerating. About 60. Maybe even late 50s because he was still in reasonably good shape. But he was a way older cat. He'd been incarcerated since 1980 doing life without name was a DB. Interesting character. I'll talk about him at length. Well, DB got pulled out of the cell and then up ran medical and the cops and me and my celly were at the window trying to figure out what was going on until they took D out in a gurney and covered up. He, he's obviously deceased. There's little question because they're in no hurry and he was in a gurney and he was completely covered. Well, that was all we knew about it for the longest time, until DB came back to the yard. They, they took his stuff out of the cell, they emptied the whole thing out, and we didn't see DB for about six months. Whenever he did come back, he explained that D had killed himself, and that DB had been a suspect. Perhaps DB had killed him, because D was hanging from a light. It's very difficult to hang yourself in a cell, but it is possible. You can take strips of sheet and braid them together until you've made a rope sufficient to carry your weight. He had purportedly done this, managed to attach it to the light and hang himself. The issue was that DB and D both had bruises on their body and roughed up knuckles, indicating that perhaps they had fought uh, pre-mortem before D was killed. And the cops were very suspicious that D.B. may have killed him and then staged the suicide. We talked about a preponderance of evidence earlier and how easy it is for the cops to determine that you are guilty of something. In this specific case, they determined that the preponderance of evidence that probably said that D.B. hadn't done it. He probably hadn't killed D. And so it was left. But... <sighs> It stuck with me for the longest time because D was my friend and DB was also my friend. I hung out with DB quite a bit. And the idea that there was no way to know what had actually happened inside of that cell well, was troubling. Suicide is uh, a terrifying end to a life. It's an awful end to a life. I, I occasionally toss out a resource whenever I do my regular videos and since the subject came up I'm going to go ahead and state explicitly there are helplines there are people that will help you anybody who is suffering from any kind of serious mental problem don't wait seek help Australian prison stories notes that in Goldblum prison the killing fields absolutely in the 90s you had to carry a shank on you at all times that is an interesting uh, thing about different prisons, the degree to which weapons are available. <clears throat> I knew a lot of yards where you knew where the knife was. You know, you could ask, hey man, if I need a piece, and they'd tell you, well, it's buried over there. Go ask Frank, he's holding. But I was never at any place where it was routine for inmates to carry a knife at all times. 
That said, in CDCR or CDC, whichever they prefer to call it, the California prison system, they do routine frisks so often that unless you were keeping that knife uh, in the gangster wallet, as it were, it was pretty inconvenient to always have a knife on you and you'd get caught pretty regularly. You just occasionally see somebody getting caught with a piece, but it didn't happen too often. Generally, they were hidden and accessible, but not actually on an inmate. Ugh. Gina Lester asks if Scooby is the saddest sentence that I knew about. Uh, for anybody who doesn't recall, Scooby, who, whose actual handle is Shaggy, but it doesn't matter either way, he was my first real celly. He looked out for me whenever I started my term at High Desert State Prison. I said I was there for six and a half years. Man, I was uh, wet behind the ears whenever I hit there. I didn't know how to do time. If my first real celly had decided to take advantage of me instead of, you know, teach me the ropes... He could have probably tricked me into doing something and got me in trouble, and he could have uh, benefited from it. At the very least, he could have not helped me. He could have just said, you're on your own. Good luck with that. That was not my experience. Uh, he called me little brother, and we got along great. He's still in prison. He is still in prison. I met him in 2002. It is currently 2022. That's 20 years ago. He had been in prison for about a decade whenever I met him. He never committed a violent crime in his life. California has a law called the Three Strikes Law, by which they mean that if you commit three felonies and they are of sufficient seriousness that you can be given strikes for them, once you commit the third one, they give you a sentence of 25 to life, and they mean it. They're not going to let you out for 25 years, and they may not let you out after that. Well, Scooby was a heroin addict, and he was a burglar. He was a good burglar, from what I understand. I went through some of this guy's paperwork, and he committed a lot, a lot of burglaries. Never hurt anybody, never saw anybody. He did steal an awful lot of stuff from people, though. You know, VCRs, TVs, whatever the stuff to burgle back in the 80s and 90s was. And he traded for heroin, because that's what heroin addicts do, is they do everything they can to stay high. Until you know, life caught up with him, and he caught that third strike. He was one of the first people in, I think, 95, 96, 97, somewhere in that time period, to catch a strike, to catch a third strike case. Well, he got a sentence of 25 to life, and he is still in prison today. He was still using whenever I knew him, all the way up until 2005 or so. He, he was an addict. I got out. I contacted him. He was on my short list of people that I wanted to write that I met in prison and say, hey, are you okay? What can I do for you, man? He's still in prison. Well, 2005, after he got in trouble for a little bit of heroin, of course, and went to the hole, he told me he asked himself, and this is so flattering, he said, what would Aaron do if he were in this situation? And he said, well, first he'd stop doing drugs. He'd start getting his education, his GED, which Scooby got, his associate's degree, which Scooby got. He would start doing NA and AA for the past 15 years, which the guy has. He'd do everything he could to demonstrate that he was no longer a threat to society and try and get out. The man has been working for the past 15 years to prove that he deserves a second chance, even though he never hurt anybody in his life. Well, it's a sad story. Dude's still locked up. His name is Brandon Mays. That's M-A-Y-S. His CDC number is E38383. And it's easy to contact him. It's easy to write the board and say, this is not right. This guy should get let out. I, I don't want to belabor the point, but that may be the saddest thing that I saw while incarcerated. Because from everything that I saw about that guy, he was a decent man. He had a drug problem, and he had uh, sticky fingers. But he stopped doing that so long ago, and he was still in prison, and he had no realistic hope of getting out all the way up to now, 20 years after I met him. Still hoping for parole eventually. That's sad. Max asks, what's the hardest or scariest or most counterintuitive aspect of adjusting to life outside of prison? 
That's a hard question. Um, listen, I was fully institutionalized by the time that I got out. I mean, I, I know that I, I present as somebody who might not have done time. I tell people I was in prison for 15 years, 16 years, more. And they, they look at me and go, really? You did time? Uh, I actually had a conversation with another convict where I told him I'd been locked up. He, he had all the tattoos. And, and I asked him where he did his time, and he talked about it for a minute. And then I mentioned I'd been at High Desert, and he kind of gave me a funny look like yeah sure whatever man tell your story but i was fully institutionalized whenever i parole i sit down at a restaurant with my wife and kids and i immediately eat everything that i can i tap that table and i look around ready to go and i i realize that i'm being silly that my job whenever it's time to eat is not to wolf that food down as soon as as quick as i can and get out of there so the next people can come in so the cops won't yell at me Similarly driving, I, I drive, and if I see a cop, highway patrol, sheriff, my heart starts going thump, 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 thump. And I just know that the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to flash that little cherry and pull me over and do a check on me and go, Aaron Channel? Well, you're supposed to be in prison, man. We didn't mean to let you out. You're going to have to get in the back of my squad car right now. It's not a realistic fear. It's, it's just that post-traumatic stress disorder. But I think the hardest thing for me to adapt to was the idea that I'm not going back. That so long as I don't commit a crime, so long as I follow the rules, they're not looking for me. They're not coming for me. Because in prison, you're always under scrutiny. They're always trying to catch you to do doing something. And that's their job. I'm not criticizing them for it. But you get used to being watched. You get used to the idea that something that wasn't even your fault, that maybe you walked out of the library with a book and then the cop looked in it and went, oh, hey, guess what I just found in here? And somebody else had hidden something in that book and you're going to the hole. That's a routine occurrence in prison. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but yeah, a lot of guys who go, I didn't do that. In prison, they may very well be telling the truth because the standard of proof is so low. As a result, the hardest thing for me to adapt to out here in the real world has been the, the idea that I'm not just going to go back for a dumb mistake, that they're not looking for me, that they're not going to chase me down and take me back no matter what I do or don't do. <sighs> Boomerang Time asks, did I ever become resigned to or comfortable living in prison? If so, which prison? That's an interesting question. There were a couple of times that I was legitimately comfortable doing time. And the thing that probably factored most, for, for me at least, as to whether or not I was able to uh, program effectively, whether I was, I was okay, was my contact with my family. I was fortunate in that my family went above and beyond. They took far more effort than most people's will to really keep me connected. They wrote me regularly. I called them daily. I was visited on a weekly basis. For as long as I was places where it was possible to be visited. High Desert, for instance, there were regular lockdowns. A lockdown is whenever they say, okay, there's a security problem of some type, and so we're just not letting anybody out of their cell until we figure it out. We'll bring the food to you, We'll bring your mail to you. You're not getting phone calls. You're not getting canteen. You're not getting visits. Stay in your cell. If an individual might need to be taken out for some reason, for instance, he had to go out to court or he had to see a doctor, they would take him individually out of his cell. But at no point is it just routine. Everybody come out of their cell, go play on the yard, go visit your family in the visiting room, go use the phone. So... The degree to which I was comfortable was generally based upon how low the security yard was and whether I was able to be visited. Chowchilla was definitely the highest quality of life that I had while I was incarcerated. The food was better. The living circumstances were better. There was very little violence on the yard. It felt safe. The library was beautiful. And yes, that's a, an important thing for me. But... I was not able to receive regular visits because Chowchilla is in central California, far away from my family. As a result, I never really settled in while I was there. 
the only other time that I really felt, I think, comfortable, I was programming and, you know, I could have stayed there for probably a long time, would be in Chino whenever I was there for just the last six months or so because I had a good friend that I made named Dutch. And he and I got along like peas and carrots. We, we kicked it. He's a good dude. Unfortunately, he paroled and went back, and I haven't heard from him since. I've written him once or twice, but I never heard back. Let's see here. I'm going to go down the call, uh, comments real quick and see if I uh, missed anything. Oh, well, we're talking about Vegas Prison Stories. It, Vegas Prison Stories is here. There we are. For anybody who doesn't know, that is a fun, entertaining channel. It's a easy watch. He does good content. And I intend to check out Austral Australian Prison Stories AU also, though I have not yet. Let's see here. Well, I think I'm actually caught up on content, which is wonderful. I was previously asked what the... Uh, hardest thing to adapt to out here in the real world was um, another would be sleep in prison you get used to certain background sounds and th the way the cell is built the way the air flows it's difficult to describe why I can always tell that I'm not in prison whenever I'm going to sleep and waking up I'm used to a concrete cell that's about yay wide, airflow that's coming in from the vent up in the corner. I'm even used to being able to hear my neighbor's toilet flush a couple times a night. A, a hundred small things. I've been out for almost five years now, and I will tell you that I still go to sleep disoriented and wake up disoriented. Because I'm not in prison. It feels like that's, that's where I should be. It's what I'm used to. It's a small thing, but your subconscious mind is really going whenever you're winding down and waking up. And I always feel just a little bit disoriented in those last moments before sleep and the first thing in the morning trying to figure out uh, why the guy in the tower isn't announcing it's time for chow and why my celly didn't wake me up to get ready. <sighs> Additionally, I've talked about the prisons that I've, I did time at so far. I mentioned San Quentin, I mentioned High Desert, and I mentioned Chowchilla. I have not really spoken about the substance abuse treatment facility, that's SADF in Corcoran, and Chino. Those are two more prisons where I did some amount of time. I was at Chino for about two years, and I believe I was at SADF for about five. SADF is interesting. It was originally designed to be a substance abuse treatment facility. That's why it's called SADF. They had planned on having counselors and regular drug testing and rehab programs available, having it be a lower security yard that people could get to if they were really trying to quit drugs. And then that prison overcrowding happened that I talked about, and so they threw that all, the, all out the window and just crammed as many inmates as they could into the prison. As I recall, whenever I was there, the prison was operating at uh, almost 200% of design capacity. I think it was 184, 190, something like that. Design capacity means that that's how many inmates they had originally planned to be there at the institution whenever they built it. That's how many beds they were planning on being filled. Operating at 200% of it means that they had twice as many inmates there as beds they had originally designed to be there, and all they did was just keep adding beds. Well, it's a cell designed for one person, no problem. Put a second bed there. Okay, we still need to keep adding beds. How about the gymnasiums? Let's put a couple hundred beds in this big open air area. And, oh, the day room bunks, we'll put 20, 40, 60 beds there. They just kept adding beds. They actually had planned on starting to build tents out on the yard and house a couple hundred inmates on each yard out in a big circus tent. But the court came down on that and said that CDC was uh, overcrowding their system to the point that inmates weren't able to get medical attention, they weren't able to do a lot of things to keep themselves safe and sane, and they made CDC release a bunch of inmates. That was near the end of my term. SADF was crowded to the gills. It was a lower security yard. There was not a heck of a lot of violence there. But any time that you take as many people as you can and put them in a small area, there's going to be some. 
Uh, Slick Armor notes that uh, the three strike law feels unconstitutional, and if I, I'm being honest, it, it feels like a, a sentence of 25 to life for nonviolent felonies. That feels cruel and unusual to me, but the court has upheld it. Another ground that has been raised by the three strikes law is that it is a violation of contract law. You see, Scooby, for example, he committed a burglary in the 80s. He got caught, and they told him, well, I tell you what, you don't have to go to prison. We're just going to give you this thing called a strike. We're going to keep track of the fact that you, you did this. What does it mean? Nothing. They said it wouldn't impact his future sentencing. It's just that it would be known that he had done this crime in the future. He might have went to trial if he had realized that they were going to change that law at some point in the future to say, well, if you have three of these, we're going to give you a sentence of 25 to life. There are a lot of guys in CDC who their first strike or their second strike, those strikes were received before they passed the three strikes law. And that should have been ruled a violation of due process and a violation of contract law. But I read the court case in which the Supreme Court said that California was able to incarcerate people however they wanted under this. Australian Prison Stories notes that he's watched videos about High Desert State Prison and Pelican Bay State Prison, and those would be the, the two nastiest prisons in California whenever I was doing time would be High Desert and Pelican Bay. They had those two prisons set off so far from all of the other prisons. There are about 30 prisons in Northern California. 25 of them are from the center of the state down. And they just have a couple further north. High Desert and Pelican Bay were the two furthest north and they were hundreds of miles from any other prisons except for a couple of lower security yards. And what they would do is if you got to High Desert, you were just going to stay there. And if somehow you arranged that you could get away from High Desert, maybe you had a problem with an officer or your points dropped low enough they'd have to send you somewhere else, they would just send you to Pelican Bay. Once you got up to those two prisons, High Desert and Pelican Bay, they planned to keep you in that little area because that's where they sent all of their high-risk inmates, their problem inmates, that type of thing. And just one. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and hearing me talk about prison for a couple of minutes. If anyone had a specific question they wanted asked, I don't mind answering it. And I'll hang out for just a minute or two while I wrap this up because there's a slight delay in the feed. I asked that question now, but it'll take me a minute or two to be able to see y'all's responses. But unless there's a specific question asked, I'm going to start wrapping it up here. I've spoken before about how I like to end these uh, little interviews with some kind of positive note. I like to think that maybe I can take from my experience just a, a tiny little nugget of wisdom, of knowledge that can help other people live their lives better. I spoke about these various prisons, San Quentin, High Desert, Sad F. They were all bad places. There were bad people there. There were good people too, but by and large, they were bad places housing bad people. That's what prison is. You know, there was not one day that there was nothing good that happened, though. Every day, there was at least a, a moment where I could look up at the sky and think what a nice day it was, or if I wasn't allowed out of my cell, I could sit there and take a couple of deep breaths and just enjoy being alive. It doesn't matter how bad things are. It's our responsibility to try and get what joy, what goodness we can out of it. Because you don't get the time back. If I'd spent all that time in prison, miserable, griping, just, God, I hate being here and I hate my life so bad, it wouldn't have gotten me out one day earlier. And now I'd be looking back at all those years spent miserable, hating life. Thank goodness that wasn't my attitude. I woke up every day and I said, I'm going to make today the best day I can. And I, I hope I continue that attitude. 
Gina Lester asks if commissary is all the same prison to prison, and the answer is by and large. Inmates are allowed to vote, actually, on what items will be held in the commissary so long as they don't violate any institutional rules. But because the list of items we can have is so narrow, and because inmates from one prison to another have pretty much the same desires, you know, they want cheap food, they want cheap cosmetics, they want the same things, commissary was pretty much the same from one prison to another. And Max asks if I gained appreciation for a specific genre of writing while I was in prison. That's funny. I'm actually just now shooting my next uh, regular video that I'm going to put out. And I was talking about libraries in prison, books in prison, westerns. I hadn't read a single western prior to my incarceration. I probably never would have. I read an awful lot of westerns while I was incarcerated. Uh, the Lonesome Dove series stands out. Louis L'Amour stands out. There are some wonderfully written westerns that I never would have read if I hadn't some of the old if I hadn't had some of the older convicts turn me on to them. I just want to say thank you to listening. Thank you for listening to everybody who tuned in today. And I hope to do another one of these tomorrow or perhaps the next day. I hope to see you then.